I'm going to deal with them uh, one by one. We have basically we have two types of contrast. One is positive contrast. Second is negative. Today we we'll talk only about the positive contrast because that's what we use in the unit system. And uh, in uh, positive contrast, it has a high atomic number with increased ability to attenuate the X-rays, and they can be either soluble or insoluble. The examples for this positive contrast media are iodine and gadolinium. The negative contrast. The examples are air and carbon dioxide, which we are not dealing with today. Uh, the po positive contrast media, where we have uh, either X-ray or CT contrast media, they are all iodates and they are all water soluble. The other contrast media we uh, discuss today are MR contrast and ultrasound contrast. Ultrasound contrast has come up in a big way today with advent of uh, no side effects, unlike uh, these two contrast media. This is a very important slide. Uh, what an ideal contrast media should have, either it is XACT or MR or ultrasound. There are a few points which uh, all of us should know. Uh, an X-ray or CT contrast media, because we use the same thing, the, it should have a good radio opacity. It should be rapidly and uh, completely absorbed in the body, and there should be a good tolerance by the patient when it is injected and there should not be any adverse side effects when it is injected into the uh, body and it should have a rapid and complete excretion from the patient's body it should have a low viscosity and low osmolarity and uh, it should be a highly water soluble so that uh, uh, it will be excreted fast and it should be uh, less of or uh, it should be of more neuro tolerability or less side effects on the uh, uh, neurogenic system and uh, it should not have any uh, useless additives within it. So there are the various features which a normal uh, or ideal CT or MR uh, CT or XA contrast media should have. Coming to MR contrast media, it should have the ability to alter the para, uh, parameters which are responsible for the MR contrast media with the help of this in the magnet and it should possess some tissue specificity because it is very important to have the enhancing pattern of the various tissues with the pathology and it should remain localized for a reasonable time because MR sequences are long and they should have retained capacity for longer duration the tissues and it must be excreted with, from the body within 24 hours. All these contrast media should be excreted within less than 24 hours from the patient's body and they should have a uh, very low toxicity because any medicine or any contrast will have some amount of side effects and toxicity and should have low toxicity and it should be very stable when it's injected. And come to the last one that is the ultrasound contrast media. This an ideal ultrasound contrast should have high echogenicity, low attenuation, low uh, blood solubility and low diffusivity and it should be able to pass through the pulmonary capillary bed. That's very important to have an ideal ultrasound contrast media and you should not have any biological effects when uh, because we can use it repeatedly and should not have any biological effects on the body. So that uh, they are the basic uh, ideal contrast media which they should possess all these characteristics. Then coming to uh, various types of contrast media we used in X-ray and CT, the two type, basically two types, one is ionics and nanoionics. Nowadays we use only nanoionics because of their safety. The ionics again they can be uh, diodates, triodates and uh, dimers but routinely what we use are the triodates and coming to non-ionics there are triodates and the uh, hexiodates and what we use today in today's practice triodates they are the monomers. So to classify these uh, contrast media we have uh, both uh, ionic and non-ionic which are monomers and dimers and what we practice or use today in the practice is uh, ionic monomers and non-ionic uh, monomers. So, and basically, non-ionic is the safest contrast media to use today, uh, unlike the pre uh, previous days. Coming to formal context of the various intravascular contrast media, once it is injected intravenously, and uh, this 70 percent of the contrast should uh, diffuse from this plasma to the extra uh, cellular space, and reverse uh, diffusion also takes place, and uh, this occurs. Equilibrium should be maintained uh, about uh, two hours after the injection of the contrast media. 
and this elimination half life of this contrast should be within 2 hours and about 75% of the contrast should be uh, excreted through urine in 4 hours and 98% should be excreted through uh, urine by 24 hours. Then if this contrast media fulfills these criteria then it's a uh, proper ideal contrast media which we use in the practice. Then coming to the mechanism of action, uh, once we uh, inject the contrast, there will be ex urinary excretion of the uh, contrast media which occurs, which takes place by the glomerular filtration and from there <coughs> the concentration of contrast into the glomerular filtrate is identical to the con plasma concentration. That's what I told in the previous slide also. It should have the plasma concentration maximum within uh, uh, th 2 to 5 minutes time and uh, obligatory water uh, reabsorption of the uh, contrast medium takes place through the uh, converted tubule within uh, for uh, 5 to 10 times within this duration and uh, water reabsorption in the distal tubule and the collecting duct produces a concentration of 30 to 50 times uh, of the level of plasma. So there are the, that's why we take uh, serial radiographs when you do an IVU so that we can see the uh, opacification of the uh, um, PCS and the ureters and the bladder depending on the concentration of the contrast media. Same way in, M in CT also we can use the contrast media to see the uh, corticomedullary nephrogenic and excretive phase of the uh, kidneys. Before using contrast media or injecting into the patient's body we should take a small precaution because most of the departments are uh, having AC and uh, these contrast media are stored in the uh, AC rooms or if they are in the, if they are, uh, oh, okay. if they are stored in a uh, uh, department then they won't be of, uh, so we have to have a proper uh, body temperature of the uh, contrast media which will uh, reduce uh, the chance of uh, adverse reactions or so that's why we should always try to keep the temperature of the contrast media as at 37, 37 degrees so that there won't be any complications or any uh, adverse effects. Coming to what are the contrast reactions, uh, these reactions are again are type 1, type 2, they are again uh, three types dose dependent, dependent, chemotoxic and uh, predictable and again in type 2 we have anaphylactoid, unpredictable non dose dependent fatal. Then what are the severity of the reactions? They can be minor, moderate and severe. Uh, in minor we have the nausea, vomiting, urticaria, pleuritis and uh, in moderate we have faintness, uh, facial edema, laryngeal edema, bronchospasm which all of you know they are the but you have to classify these uh, uh, reactions into three categories. In severe we have the pulmonary edema, respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest and seizures. And how to treat them? All of you know this, uh, I'm not, I won't go into uh, details of all these things like uh, nausea, vomiting, urticaria, hypotension, trigger. So they should be handled uh, without uh, um, any delay because these reactions sometimes they can be very severe and can be fatal. So that's why this bronchospasm and any infantry reaction seizures, this should be managed uh, with uh, proper uh, medication. When all this extravasation of contrast, we should try to elevate the extremity which is uh, where the excavation takes place and we use high packs to reduce the swelling and also uh, it should be uh, watched at least 2 to 4 hours if it is really increasing swelling then we may have to go for surgical uh, consultation to evacuate that uh, extravasated contrast media. There are few studies which are uh, um, ideal for to know what are the safety standards of these uh, contrast media. One is the uh, Katayama study which was done in 1990. Uh, it says that about uh, the percentage of uh, adverse reactions with the uh, ionic contrast is 12.66 percentage with non-ionics it is 3.13. That is the reason we always use non-ionics though in uh, previous days we used to use only ionics. With the advent of non-ionic we, we use uh, only non-ionic contrast media which have less adverse effects. The Palmer study uh, of uh, Royal Australian study is done in 1992 and it uh, has classified that <coughs> patients say that they receive ionic or non-ionic, they are divided into high risk and low, low risk groups. 
what it conclude is that it is better to be a high risk patient with who receives non ionic contrast rather than a low risk patient who receives ionic contrast that's how the uh, study concludes uh, in this uh, evaluation and the last study it says that patients are divided into two groups one is a patient receiving ionic with pre medication with steroids second group receiving non ionics without any uh, steroids then the analysis revealed that uh, pre medication with steroids does not help to reduce the risk of uh, contrast related reactions so it doesn't have really a bearing in uh, if you do pre medication though it is said that pre medication helps but it's not really true according to this study so there are three uh, landmark studies which tell us that yes we we what we have to deal with when we are uh, seeing a piece of contrast media cin this one uh, there are two hot topics today uh, they are uh, very uh, important exam for students for exam point of view because they are often asked in the exams uh, what is uh, contrast induced nephropathy it is an acute disease in the renal function uh, decrease in the renal function following the intravascular administration of a contrast agent in the absence of any other cause so in a normal patient who has normal uh, re, uh, level of uh, serum creatinine and when you inject contrast he develops uh, renal function deterioration it generally occurs in 2 to 3 days after administration of contrast and most often it settles on its own without any intervention within a week's time but if it doesn't um, come down then these patients will go into cir so again i won't go through the normal parameters you know that uh, serum creatinine level which should be uh, taken care before giving a contrast media and uh, whenever uh, this uh, contrast media is injected again i won't go to all these uh, physiological things because the uh, there is lot of contrast media to be discussed so i won't go into this and coming to stage of the ckd and how uh, the gfr level because gfr is more sensitive compared to serum creatinine levels nowadays most of the centers they are slowly switching from uh, uh, taking as parameter the creatinine that going gfr is a standard uh, uh, method <coughs> and uh, what are the clinical features of uh, these uh, cn uh, cn mostly it uh, occurs in uh, uh, within first 24 to 24 hours and peak is in 3 uh, to 5 days of the contrast uh, creatinine level and this just generally it is a self limiting that's why it is called as benign creatinopathy and it doesn't need any inter, uh, treatment in most of the cases and it is basically a sequence of uh, uh, or it's a consequence of the medullary ischemia which leads to uh, direct toxic effect on the tubular cells and uh, these three can lead to tubular necrosis so that's how the whole process takes because medullary ischemia occurs because of the increased uh, oxygen consumption of the tubular cells and when these not uh, taken care then these patients land up in tubular necrosis this is summary of the whole uh, cin contrast induced nephropathy uh, which i have already discussed right now how to prevent uh, the was the things which we should always take care when we give uh, contrast it's better always to give hypotonic saline about 12 hours before and continue of 12 hours after the contrast medium is injected or isotonic uh, saline which is injected uh, infused about 4 hours before the contrast injection and continued up to 12 hours after the exposure uh, and oral hydration can be done about a 1 liter about 10 hours duration so there are the few precautions with which we can uh, prevent a patient going in for cin then volume expansion also can be done because uh, there are various things most important thing is the recent one is uh, <coughs> we can use uh, intravenous uh, sodium bicarbonate this also helps to prevent uh, cn and the medicines the drugs which are used often are the sodium bicarbonate and the anesthetic system these two are the uh, medications which can prevent cn uh, cn in any patient of uh, uh, altered or increased serum creatinine levels 
and uh, what with drug concomitant drugs which should be avoided during uh, uh, use of contrasterol nsaids cox2 inhibitors diuretics ace inhibitors aminoglycosides and metformin and drugs which can be used in uh, cin are the uh, nac that means n-acetylcysteine dopamine and uh, uh, fendolamine so there are a few drugs which should be uh, used to handle this situation take home message the guidelines which i have discussed till now they should be followed to prevent any patient going in for cin then uh, I will go from here fast because uh, there is short of time. MR contrast media, again we have four categories, diamagnetic, paramagnetic, superparamagnetic and ferromagnetic. In these ferromagnetic and diamagnetic they are not uh, uh, useful. We have both paramagnetic and superparamagnetic but they are not available with us. So what we are uh, today de dealing with are the paramagnetic with their T1 agents. And again we have both intra and extracellular uh, um, contrast uh, agents and in which uh, multi hands has the better role in these contrast agents and again the classification depending on the uh, relaxation time enhancement distribution molecule shape size time based so there are various components which we have to uh, classify the mr contrast media depending on these uh, six uh, criteria how it uh, acts the contrast uh, medium the mr contrast is a hydrophilic contrast so it attracts water molecule and Gallium is an unpaired electron which creates a local magnetic field and it facilitates the release of RF energy absorbed by the proton. The shortness of relaxation time and enhances the signal emitted. So the, in summary, uh, the lesion of, is seen because of the disturbed blood-brain barrier. That's how the, when once is blood-brain barrier is disturbed, there will be accumulation of the contrast medium which is seen as hyper intense signal on post contrast image of the abnormal area of uh, the part examined the kidney or bladder or ureter then uh, various uh, again these variables what we have contrast variables scanning variables and patient variables depending on these criteria again the uh, enhancing pattern depends on the uh, background contrast again uh, transmetallation this also again uh, there is increasing evidence that there is a chemical instability of the uh, chelating agent when it uh, lead to exchanges with other metals like zinc, copper and calcium uh, which can cause uh, uh, complications with uh, uh, gadolinium when they are chelating with them. The other problem with, uh, unlike in uh, uh, CIN here we have a NSF that is nephrogenic systemic fibrosis when patients undergo MR contrast uh, media studies then patient their possibility that the patient can develop uh, uh, NSF and this is a version known as nephrogenic fibrosing dermopathy NFD and it was recognized in 1997 and uh, it is described in 2000 and today the terminology is changed and it is uh, NSF is a better term not the NFD and uh, Again, same thing, this uh, patients who underwent MR contrast media in Denmark and Austria, they developed the symptoms and uh, this term was coined. And this is a website where you can have more information about this uh, entity. NF, uh, now we should use the old word NSF. So NSF uh, is, an, it is an acquired iatrogenic disorder that manifests only in patients with chronic kidney disease when GFR is uh, less than 60 ml per minute. So they are the patients who are susceptible for uh, NSF and there is no racial predisposition, there is no, uh, is common in both uh, males and females and it should be done, diagnosis should be done by deep skin biopsy. On histopathology, there will be uh, sclerobexoderma and they will have uh, uh, dendritic cells, thickened collagen bundles, increased elastic fibers and mucin deposit in the skin. That's how the histopathology confirms the diagnosis of NSF and uh, the, uh, the patients who have developed this condition will have uh, thickening and flexion extension of the patient uh, joints will be restricted, there will be contractures and, and other skin problems also can be developed in this condition. And the prevention, it can be by screen, we should screen the patient for any CKD, immediate post gallium we should do hemodialysis and uh, we should try to use the uh, safe uh, gadolinium agents and how to avoid try to use the alternative imaging modality if uh, if it is available 
and try to reduce the dose as low as possible so that the so that the adverse effects are less and it should be used judiciously